you were Home Secretary in 2005, I believe. 2004, 2006. Yeah, so, so when we um, opened up to the new accession countries um, and had a very kind of uh, open border policy to them, um, more than we were mandated to do by our European Union requirements. Do you now look back on that as the right decision or do you think we should have been more cautious about that? It was the right decision. If we decided to open uh, to encourage the A8 countries, so-called Poland and others, to join the EU, then the consequence of that was freedom of movement from those countries. The decision we took in uh, 19 in 2004, actually shortly before I became Home Secretary, but I supported it, was that instead of leaving a seven-year transition period, we'd allow that to happen right away. I still think that was the right decision. The economy made it happen, and we took it forward in the right way. Uh, I think there are some issues about uh, how the issue developed in, 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 in after that, uh, but we produced a white paper in January 2005 which set out new controls on immigration more generally, an Australian-style point system for people coming from outside the EU, for example. But the suggestion that we should have stopped people who were EU member state citizens from coming to the EU I think was wrong and I think it was always wrong. But when you look now at the, the Brexit vote and the fallout from that, many of the areas that were most strongly in favour of Brexit are those places that received large numbers of um, immigrants during that period. I don't Do really think I don't really think that's quite, I don't really think that's right. Um, the main reason for the Brexit vote was a sense of alienation by millions of people parallel to the alienation of millions of people in the United States, which led to the election of Trump, parallel to the alienation which gave support for Marine Le Pen uh, in France and so on. And these were millions of people from, from the globalised world which had developed. They were people who saw themselves, often with good justifications, as losers from that process of globalisation, one aspect of which was immigration, but it was only one aspect yeah. of that. And so you saw, for example, in the northeast of England, an end to coal mining, an end to shipbuilding, an end to steel. And in those circumstances, did governments do enough to create an economic future in those areas which had lost out from globalisation? In my opinion, no. And I think certainly our government, but the current government too, has to accept responsibility for failures in that area. And as a result of the failure of governments like mine, to address the problems that people were concerned about, whether immigration, whether tax and spend, whether welfare reform, a whole set of issues, people felt that their voices were not heard and they gradually, 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 in ways I set out in my book, The Too Difficult Box, ended up feeling that populist answers were the right answers. Do you feel even more broadly that that whole kind of globalised project that in a sense was started by that Tony Blair government in parallel with the Clinton administration in America, you know, which at the time seemed so kind of virtuous and so much the kind of opening of boundaries. Do you feel that, in retrospect, was too much too soon? I don't think there was any alternative. It wasn't started by Blair and Clinton. It's quite true they went along with it. It was actually started by Thatcher and Reagan, mm. who had a set of views, for example, if you think of the uh, opening up of the stock markets under th Margaret Thatcher's administration, I don't even think that was wrong. It was a process of globalisation. Mm. And the criticism which can be made of our government, Tony Blair's government, Bill Clinton's government, was of not looking hard enough at the losers from that globalisation process and what we could and should do to ensure that that uh, uh, negative consequence was at least ameliorated and possibly advantaged. Mm. So there are a whole set of policies, some around governance of uh, immigration, some around uh, education and training for people uh, mm. at, at different levels, there's a whole set of different issues but where we can be fairly criticised for not doing enough. Yeah. But the idea that you could somehow stop the globalisation process and say, OK, stop, we want to get off, which was a Tony Benn solution many years ago, it was a Soviet Union solution, you could have socialism in one country or whatever. Mm. I always think that's wrong. You know, we were talking to Lisa and Andy earlier who, who were saying that the appeal of the Labour Party in local towns like hers in Wigan is struggling, where you know they're seen increasingly as being a party of the kind of metropolitan. That again really was a, a shift that started during that Blair revolution. Do you, do you feel like on those grounds more should have been done to kind of hold the hand of the original Labour demographic. I agree with Lisa completely, and I think the, the question of a perceived metropolitan elite running the country, uh, and I say perceived, uh, I'm not implying that's not the case. There's a large, a large amount of truth in that perception. Was there, and it strengthened during the time of the Blair government, 
Uh, and that is a challenge actually facing not just Labour in Britain, but social democratic parties across uh, the world. If you look at social democrats in Germany, for example, a classic illustration. And are we, social democrats, representatives of the oppositionist forces, the losers, or the builders of the future? And we have not succeeded in reconciling that. If you look at social democracy, as I say, throughout Europe, that issue is there, writ very large, and that's the challenge, and that remains the challenge today, which, by the way, Lisa, who I think is a very good member of Parliament, is working hard to try and reconcile. Do you think part of it is, is social, the, you know, the, the sort of con more conservative strains that have always been there in working class culture and, and remain strong in places across England? are now not spoken of by the Labour leadership? I don't, actually. Um, the Blue Labour movement was a, a movement which tried to reflect that view. Uh, I would say it's a romantic and outdated view, saying the past was like this, we ought to be more like the past. And I simply think that's not right for social democrats, socialists of any description. I think you have to look to the future and say, what are we building for the future? Now, the challenge is, did we do that? And I would say in some areas we did, but in other areas we failed. And the Brexit issue has brought that to a very sharp crunch.